Okay, great. Folks, we're going to get started. If I get everybody's attention, that'd be great. Uh, welcome and thanks for coming tonight. My name is Jay McDonald and I'm with Elasticsearch. Um, I wanted to also, of course, thank Living Social for agreeing to present and to host us here tonight, providing pizza, beverages of different sorts, um, specifically Dan Meyer and, um, oh, he's right here, Jonathan Phillips, sorry, disappeared out of my range of vision. Um, so let me move from thanking the hosters to doing what I always do, which is beg for more presenters, more hosters. If you can't present, but you can host, that's great. If you can host, but you can't present, we need that too. If you can do both, that makes it all simple and easy. But if you think you got an interesting story that, um, that the group would like to hear, we'd love to incorporate you into this meetup group uh, as a hoster. Um, so a couple more, a couple announcements. So um, as a company now, Elasticsearch, the company uh, which inc incorporates products uh, like Elasticsearch and Logstash and Kibana, and a new product called Marvel, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, as a company, we provide training and support for customers. Uh, we have a training class coming up. Uh, it's going to be in Northern Virginia, and uh, that's the good news. The bad news is it's sold out. So, uh, or maybe that's good news too, right? It's good news it's sold out. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Uh, but meaning there's no more seats now. So I just say keep your eye on the website, and um, you know hopefully we'll be adding more uh, training classes in the area soon in case that's of interest to you. And if you're interested in our support offerings, just come find me or send me an email or come find me through the meetup group. Happy to talk to you guys about that. Um, so Marvel is the uh, first commercial product that we uh, have taken to market. Um, I thought we had a banner, but we don't. Uh, but uh, it essentially provides uh, the ability to monitor and manage, manage the health of your uh, Elasticsearch cluster. So it's been received really well. I just was talking to Brian, who said he's a happy user and dev right now. Uh, so check it out. Uh, it's free, uh, free to use in, in development and uh, free to play with. Once you move into production, it does cost some money. Uh, but that was an exciting step for us as a company, a uh, small, uh, early, fairly early phase um, uh, company putting out, uh, open source company putting out our first commercial product. Um, and then, where's Juan? Where's Juan? There's Juan and Sean, right on time. You got to come in here. <laughs> Put your bag down. No. Uh, so just real quick, uh, Juan Thomasy is uh, part of our dev team. Uh, he specifically works on... Um, Front end stuff, Cabana, uh, and then Sean Gallagher, who just uh, braved the traffic and made it in the nick of time, uh, is one of our support engineers. So he's providing uh, help to customers every day. Um, so I just wanted you guys to be aware of them um, in case you want to introduce yourselves uh, at some point during this event. Uh, I'm going to hand things off to Dan real quick, and then John's going to get down to business with the talk. Hey, uh, I'm Dan Mayer from Living Social, and just wanted to say thanks everybody for coming out. Um, if I had thought about this earlier, I would have definitely had more chairs and cleared out some of the desks. My bad for the kind of awkward seating for those in the right. Sorry about that. Um, but I guess a lot of people are actually showing up at these meetings, so that's a good thing. Um, I guess real quick, we want to give a chance for any announcements. If anybody has like uh, positions related to like Elasticsearch that their company's looking for, uh, feel free raise a hand and we can call call you out. Stand by. All right. Well, no. It, yeah. If nobody else, we'll hire Elasticsearch people. So if somebody wants to work on Elasticsearch, you know, come talk to me or John a little later. Uh, and then I guess real quick, we also wanted to see if anybody had like quick stories they might want to tell. Uh, like right now or after the presentation of like what they think is like a kind of unique Elasticsearch use case because I feel like right now a lot of people they're using it for their logs, a lot of people are using it for app search, but there's some really unique things I've heard people are doing so I'm always interested in hearing other problems being solved with Elasticsearch. So I don't know, if anybody has a story maybe like nudge us at the end and we can get you up here. Cool. And with that I will introduce John who's actually speaking. Silent room, tough crowd. How's it going, guys? Uh, <laughs> all right, nice. Uh, I'm John Phillips. Uh, I'm an application engineer at uh, Living Social, and my Twitter handle is El Guapa1611. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that's an ironic name. Okay. 
uh, okay. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of our uh, some of our Elasticsearch integration, but I'm going to go over these topics, some challenges that we've encountered, um, and what are we trying to solve with Elasticsearch. Uh, I'm going to go over some very broad e-commerce concepts with collections and tiles, um, and along with that, with search techniques and what to show. Right, it's Elasticsearch after all. <laughs> Uh, and I'm also going to go over some testing techniques that we're using right now to make sure that Elasticsearch is performing the way we want. Okay, and this includes A-B testing and uh, background searches. So a lot of people talk about Elasticsearch within the context of performance, software performance, but I'd like to take a step back and actually look at it from a business standpoint. Okay, okay so challenges without Elasticsearch. Okay, so we're a pretty large company. We've got uh, over 100 engineers, and one thing that happens that is a pretty big pain point is data decentralization, okay? Um, and another thing is we need to define collections and e-commerce priorities. So those are two problems that we want to solve with Elasticsearch. Okay, so let's go into data decentralization. What does that mean? Okay, well, when I started, I was one of the first engineer, uh, one of the first ten engineers. Like very early on, uh, our application was a single app, and since then we've separated out into a service-oriented architecture where we have a large application platform. All right. Okay. So, within the context of our homepage, I want to go over some some results of that. Okay. So this is a screenshot of our current homepage. And one thing to keep in mind is that we have page sections here. And the page sections are actually a sign of pods and product segmentation. Uh, pods is an internal term that we use as an organizational uh, term for groups of engineers, visual designers, project managers, product people, et cetera, et cetera. Usually they're less than 10 people. Okay. Uh, just to go over things, local deals, we got some more tiles. So that's a team, events are a team, we've got escapes, we've got products. There's a bunch of different things, right? So product buckets are the result of pods. They're kind of aggregations of data, right? Now, there's some consequences here that are not so obvious. Um, products and offers are difficult to mix. So one thing that happens is you have data that gets centralized into these pods, and all of a sudden you want to start selling them together. It becomes difficult, right? Um, sometimes you have code duplication where the APIs are actually duplicated between teams. Okay? Uh, feature parity can get out of sync. Uh, sometimes teams roll forward with a particular set of application, uh, application um, uh, features and they get out of sync with other, with other teams. Um, and the mo one of the most important things is that data can come from any number of resources. So this is one of the big problems that we're dealing with. And I want to go into a little bit more detail about data inconsistencies. OK, so there are similar fields between applications that can be slightly different. And that might seem obvious, but they can mean completely different things, right? So we have similar things that seem similar on the surface, but they're actually very different. Um, data inconsistencies can actually be necessary. So that's, that's a key point here. Just because there's data inconsistencies, these, uh, these pieces of data are actually necessary and unique to an object's domain. <coughs> and I'll go into that a little bit right now. Okay, so examples on the home page. Let's uh, look at deals, escapes, and products. Okay, so here are three tiles from deals, escapes, and products. And they all have a title and a subtitle. I'm just gonna concentrate on that. Okay, so on deals, the top, the title, is the company name. On escapes, it's the description of the product. And here, the product name is the, is the product name, right? Okay, so subtitle here, whoa, description. Here, it's the company name. And in products, it's not available. So already, you can see that content inconsistencies are required based on domain. And the reason why is because domain models will be different. And what I mean by that is it's impractical for the escapes team to call the company name subtitle, all right? So, Elasticsearch to the rescue. Uh, we're using Elasticsearch as a 
presentation layer for our data. Okay? And I call this a generic view of e-commerce tiles because that's what we're using it for. <laughs> okay, so content inconsistencies are required based on domain. I said that one minute ago, and I'm about to, I'm about to contradict myself. All right, so the home page is outside. My argument is that the home page and tiles in general, anytime you have a list of collections, it's actually outside of the domain of an individual application. There are separate concerns that deserve their own data model, right? And in, uh, in Elasticsearch, this is called the mapping. Okay, so here's an explanation. Um, search results and collections have their own concern, and I'll go into a little bit more depth later. Um, and they should have their own data model, right? So let's look at some e-commerce examples of lists outside of Living Social. And these are all very common. Everybody uses Amazon. I presume some of you have used Newegg and Williams Sonoma, okay? So they all kind of look the same, right? Tiles are approximately the same thing across them. And I call tiles the, e the, the Taco Bell of e-commerce. And what I mean by that is it's a tortilla with meat, cheese, or vegetables. That's a Jim Gaffigan quote, all right? So let's break down an e-commerce tile. We got an image. We got a title, we got a subtitle, we got a category, a rating, a price, MSRP, a URL. That's where we're gonna go when we click on it. And sometimes the label, sometimes it waffles a little bit, all right? So you wanna take control. You, wanna, you want to take control of this mapping and allow each team uh, to publish into that, into that data model, right? But you don't wanna give them too much control. Uh, the way that we handle this and preventing random data from ending up in our Elasticsearch cluster is by uh, defining the data model in a client gem that acts as a, that acts as a container. Um, and it handles all the validations prevent, and does all the mapping for you. Okay. So we want to define a common mapping to remove data inconsistencies. And once it's defined, it's very easy for individual teams to decide how they want their search results to look. Okay, domain objects are simplified within the context of search, which is very, very powerful. Okay. Um, one thing that I've learned after working on search is that you can't have a single team, when you have a large service-oriented architecture with teams that are somewhat isolated from one another, uh, decentralized data, you absolutely need decentralized indexing, where each team is controlling the content of pushing their, their content into the cluster. Um, and the awesome thing about Elasticsearch is that the, uh, the indexing API makes integration simple from this standpoint. Okay. John, pause one second. Sure. Oh. Is that better? Oh, oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, so decentralized indexing, why is it important? Uh, so, there are always going to be inconsistencies across teams, and one thing I want to talk about is, is timing. So we have certain apps, or you might run into apps where uh, the indexing needs to happen immediately, and other times where you, want to happen, where you want the indexing to happen in bulk, okay? Data stores can be different. Some apps use MySQL, other apps use uh, Redis or something else, right? You might have different, uh, you might have different data sources and whether or not you can use a, something like a slave database to populate Elasticsearch, right? Um, uh, sometimes you want, uh, app, you want your data to be indexed when the content changes. Other times it's not that important, right? The most important thing here is that each team has domain knowledge. No one knows an application better than its creator or maintainer, and that's what I've learned. Uh, when we were initially rolling out Search, the way it worked is all the indexing code <coughs> sat inside one app, and we would reach out to each individual team's data sources and pull it in. And what I learned is that there were always cases where there was built-in business logic that we couldn't understand or we didn't foresee. And then what would happen is a customer would call up and be like, hey, why is my, why is my content showing up in this weird way? And it's because I made a mistake, because I didn't know that, okay? Okay, so uh, the benefits of a common tile model it, it, these are the three 
just to kind of summarize, it allows teams to own their own indexing. It allows mixing of product offerings because we've now taken all these different things and we've, we've made a common mapping that we can now uh, compare and contrast across all different product offerings. And again, it, it eliminates data inconsistencies. Okay, okay so we have, we have these tiles, right? We need to define collections and when I say defining collections, we need to define an e-commerce priority, okay? So what is a collection? It's just a group of documents. And usually they're unified by a common set of traits, right? So here's some examples. We have nearby deals, we have search results, emails. These are all lists, these are examples of collections. And generally collections have two concerns, what to show and how to show it as a tile, right? We already talked about how to show it as a tile. Um, I always think of collections as filters. And just to go over some site-wide architecture for those of you who are new to, uh, uh, to those of you who haven't seen Living Social before, um, this is our header. And in the context of search, this filter would be sh showing all deals for Washington, D.C., right? We're eliminating all deals outside of Washington, D.C. Okay, here's another example of a filter where all of a sudden we're, add, we're adding a filter called only show me restaurant deals, right? These are all e-commerce filters. Okay, so other filters that are common in e-commerce, whether or not a product is in stock, whether or not it's near a city, tagged with a term, price range, expiration date, et cetera, all right? So those all prune your data set, right? So filters in Elasticsearch prune your data set. Prioritization. More specifically, how to establish sort order. Okay, so let's go into prioritization now. We have a list of uh, we have a list of content. Now we want to sort it appropriately. Um, I think of priori prioritization as a um, as a real estate issue, location, location, location. And on Living Social, we we're a very high traffic website where every single spot on on our site uh, has an opportunity cost of pushing out other content. So we have to optimize revenue based on what's slotted where, right? So every location on a page has a potential value and you want to maximize that potential value. I already said that. Okay, so Elasticsearch is the rescue again, right? So again, this is, I didn't want to go into too much depth about function scoring and some of the code that we use to, to do this. Um, but I wanted to determine what to show and sort order, and I'm just gonna, gonna give you a very, very, very uh, shallow view of what this means, okay? Elasticsearch, we can do it with the search API. <laughs> okay, so let's go over some basics. I'm gonna talk about filters versus queries, function scores, and uh, this is the base of, uh, of the body of a search, okay? So this is what it looks like in, inside of our app. And uh, you might notice that we have, a, we have a little filtered query here, okay? So I think of every single Elasticsearch as a set of filters and queries, all right? So what is a filter? And this is actually from the Elasticsearch website. It's for binary yes, no searches. And it's for queries on exact values, all right? Filters don't affect the relevance score. So this is basically you're pruning your list. You don't want to affect the order, right? And what are queries? Queries are for full text search and where the result depends on a relevance score. Okay, so this is very important. Relevance score here is, is uh, what we use to determine um, what you want to use for uh, establishing uh, a business value or, or your sort order for a tile. Okay, the relevance score will be used for the sort order. Okay, so Search queries can contain business logic for prioritizing what's on the page. This is really important. Um, instead, of having, uh, instead of having each team determine these things, you can algorithmically decide how to prioritize things across teams, which is great. All right? But how do we combine multiple concerns together to establish an, ultima, uh, an optimal sort order? This is really important. Um, we're using function score internally. Um, Basically, a function score is the ability to pass in any number of different queries and combine them together to establish a sort order. Okay, so a function score. 
Um, we can establish relevance on multiple functions. And here's some examples. Proximity to start date, proximity to end date, proximity to lat long, et cetera, et cetera, right? The list goes on. Revenue generated, and number of purchases in the last order. So these are all different example, examples of how you can combine these things together to get an optimal sort order. Uh, you might also notice that uh, here we have number of purchases in the last order, so there's, there's relevance um, based on time as well. Okay. Okay. So sort functions should maximize your revenue. And they should, rev they should maximize your revenue in both short and long term. Okay. Uh, one thing that we've determined is that short term earning is very easy to measure. You can figure out how many, how much revenue is being generated. The problem is, is that generally each client, each client of our site should be, we should be thinking about them in the long term, right? Um, you have to take into account things like user acquisition, long term value of a, of a customer, et cetera, right? So short term, very easy to measure. Long term, you have to do these longitudinal, uh, you have to look at the data longitudinally, right? And one thing that's kind of interesting is that there's a, there's a ton of places where uh, lower income or lower value items actually have a long term impact on, on revenue. So an example of this is Amazon's Kindle where they actually sell it at a loss with the, with the idea that they'll make up the, the difference in the long term. All right, so decay functions. This is really cool. So in, in uh, the function scoring, you can use the decay functions to determine the relevance score as distance increases. So in this case, I have a latitude and longitude, and uh, it's, it's figuring out how uh, the relevance based on distance from a particular point. All right, and in this case, the scale is 15 kilometers, and the decay is 0.2. So in this case, we're just looking at uh, distance. Uh, okay, so one thing I wanted to say is that there are tons of resources out there. One of the most helpful uh, videos I've seen is actually by Britta Weber on the Elasticsearch page, um, and she goes over some great scoring functions. And there's the URL, and we'll post this uh, after, after the presentation. Okay, so tips for testing in production. So one, one thing that we ran into uh, is that we have an existing infrastructure. And we need to figure out how to make that switch over. Currently, we're using Sphinx, and we were, we're testing out Elasticsearch in production. Um, and one thing that we were concerned about is just making the switch altogether, right? Elasticsearch in production doesn't equal Elasticsearch locally, and we just wanted to make sure that we weren't breaking anything and, and decreasing revenue in the long run, right? So before rolling out a new search infrastructure, you have to test, 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 right? This is a general rule, all right? What do I mean by testing? Um, you gotta test the stability of your infrastructure and the business impact on your change, right? And we do this with A-B testing. The other thing I want to keep in, uh, that you should keep in mind is that your t all your tests should be invisible to the user. All right, uh, the way that we're handling this at Living Social is with background searches. So we're we're testing performance before going live, uh, and th obviously this assumes that you have an existing infrastructure to test on. Um, what this looks like in the Rails app is we run a search on the existing infrastructure. We queue a background event to hit Elasticsearch, and then uh, we actually started bumping up the percentage. So it's starting very low, but uh, you can always use a percentage of your total, and uh, return the results from the existing infrastructure to the user, and then analyze what's being returned from Elasticsearch. That way, way you're limiting what the user is seeing. So how do we analyze performance? Uh, Marvel, New Relic, Rear view, that's a living social product. Um, these are all things that are testing the performance of, of, our, uh, of our search API. Okay, so one thing that happens a lot is people will look at search results and say, why isn't this showing up? Um, we've built an internal, internal tool for analyzing the, analyzing the search results using Elasticsearch Explain. 
Um, so you want to, you always want to understand why Elasticsearch is returning, returning results in a specific order. And you also want to understand why a specific document isn't in the search results. And you can do that with explain. And explain is just an API built into Elasticsearch. Okay. So very simple. When you run a search, all you have to do is pass in true for the explain, and it'll give you all the explanation for the query breakdown. All right. Uh, so TFIDF is something that comes up a lot, and Elasticsearch is built on Lucene. So one thing that, what it means is you have term frequency, inverse document frequency. Um, the explain will often have these terms baked into it. Um, term frequency is how much a particular term shows up in your document. And inverse document frequency is how, it how much it shows up across the compendium of information in your, in your index. Uh, and these are all results, or these are all uh, uh, keywords from Lucene, all right? And I shamefully took these from LucineTutorial.com. Okay, so A-B test. You've, you've assembled this list of queries and you're trying to test out the, the sort order. You can't ever assume that you have the correct sort order before uh, pushing something fully to production. So what we like to do is A-B test where you're actually, you're actually passing in the search query as a term and then you A-B test on it. All right, see which one performs the best. And by perform, I mean business. Uh, I, I mean uh, dollars, dollars earned. All right, and that's it. That's all I got. Uh, we are hiring. Jobs.livingsocial.com uh, uh, jobs is the URL. So I'm open for questions. <laughs> All right, I'm out. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, how big is your data set and how does that affect, like, how fast can you expect it mm -hmm. to go and come back to like, yeah. do a lot of performance testing? What are your yep. expectations? So right now, uh, at any given time, we're running less than 100,000 documents, which is really small, but our traffic is really high. So what we expect from, uh, from Elasticsearch are search results less than 20 milliseconds-ish, 25 milliseconds. So generally, that's, that's what we'll do. If, if there's any queries that are really slow, we'll use cache warmers, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the times what happens is if we have, if we have search results coming in, we'll actually cache the, cache the data set outside as markup or whatever. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so for that's more of a tech ops question, but uh, the the hardware. Oh yeah, the question is, um, can I talk about our hardware infrastructure? Um, so r currently, we're kind of rolling this out um, in the background. Uh, we just switched over to solid state hard drives. We have a lot of RAM, um, powerful machines, uh, and I think right now we're only running two, uh, two servers. Uh, but we're just constantly playing around with this stuff, and a lot of the searches that are happening right now are still in the background. So we're just load testing, tweaking things as necessary. Yeah. Sphinx, yeah. So uh, the question was, what were we, <laughs> what were we using before? Uh, we are currently using Sphinx. Uh, that's what we're hoping to replace. Yeah. Why are you looking to replace Sphinx? Uh, the biggest problem that we've run into is that Sphinx is difficult to distribute across all our engineers. So if you want to run it uh, locally, uh, because all the indexing happens inside the individual search application. Uh, you have to have all these other dependencies installed and it just becomes difficult to distribute across the engineering work. 
So Elasticsearch just makes it very easy to roll, the, roll out search to everyone's computer. All the, all the engineers find it very easy to, to integrate with. Um, the service runs on a single rake test that just installs everything, does, sets up all the data. It's very simple. That's, that's, the, that's the big reason. Yeah, so, so the question is, do you delete the expired documents? Um, so the long term, right now we don't have a, a need for that because the number of documents is so low, it doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, for SEO, you might want those documents in the Elasticsearch, especially if they're user facing. So the, the, short, the short term answer is no, we are not going to delete documents. Uh, what I was thinking about doing is maybe having a rolling index where out-of-date documents get moved into an older Elasticsearch uh, or a deprioritized Elasticsearch cluster. Yeah. Uh, so far, uh, what we've seen is that we haven't had to do that. Yeah, uh, but generally, uh, there, there are different pages on our site that, will, that always benefit from caching, but so far, in terms of just raw searches, we haven't had to, we haven't had to cache externally outside of Elastic. Yeah, yeah, actually, so, so each, uh, each tile has a bunch of different nested content inside of it. Uh, we, we use, um, uh, an example is addresses and locations. We actually store that as a nested object inside the JSON, which has been super useful. Um, and then it just passes back the entire JSON object, which we can use in the front end, which has been very easy to use. Yeah, oh yeah, it's also very helpful for, mo for mobile. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some people split it split it out into a parent child type thing where you have joins within Elasticsearch. So, you know, but we haven't we haven't done that. Again, our data is our data set is pretty small for for this application. So, do you only have one document type? No, no, no. So, so the way it works is uh, the mapping between document types is the same. But, uh, and that's, so you can do the comparison across all of them, all the, all the data types are, are approximately the same, but it allows you to scope based on, based on document type. So like, we'll have uh, local deals, escapes, et cetera, et cetera, each with their own type, but they'll have the same mapping, approximately the same mapping. So we can do the comparisons. Uh, have you tried the mm -hmm. So uh, we're using aggregations, and for most of the aggregations, we're, uh, I set it up to do um, uh, using the warming API, whatever. Um, so we're, the aggregations are relatively simple because the document count is low, um, and we're doing things like price faceting, uh, uh, cities, locations, address faceting, stuff like that. But yeah, the aggregation, the aggregation stuff that was added in 101 was great. Yeah. Jonathan, you, you mentioned you're using Marvel. Can you talk a little bit about how you're using that? Yeah. And also, if you're using Nirvana, yeah. to visualize some of the data that's available. Yeah. So internally, we use Kibana to do some logging. And most of it is used for debugging issues in production. So that could be 
like cookie issues with cookies or watching a user walk through the, the flow of purchasing. Uh, that's what we use uh, Kibana for. Um, in what was the other question? Oh yeah, yeah, so uh, Marvel currently we only use on developer machines to track the performance of each uh, of the queries and actually monitor it locally. And it gives us a good idea of what it'll look like in production. So initially it's more of a diagnostic thing that we use in, in development. Uh, although there is a tech house request to get into production as well. <laughs> Uh, not much. We we just uh, upgraded to 1.1 today, uh, and there are a couple of new features that are really interesting. Like when you have these large uh, queries that come together, you're sending along giant JSON objects across your network, right? And they have uh, they have query templates now that you can store inside Elasticsearch. So you're just sending back and forth the params, which is really interesting. So I'm going to play around with that. Uh, tomorrow, probably. Yeah. On the uh, delayed process you're talking about, you know, the decentralized training, mm -hmm. where you can put your own content in there. Mm -hmm. you can. Yep. Um, are, are they pushing directly in, or are they making this recall pushing, pushing document thing, or do you have an abstraction layer over the systems? We have an abstraction layer over the systems, yeah. so. So there are a couple things. Uh, the, the abstraction layer is actually required for security. Uh, and uh, we, you have to proxy everything. And then we also do validations through that proxy as well. So it's a thin layer that sits, sits between the apps. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, actually. So, so one thing, uh, one thing that we do is uh, the search cluster actually isn't directly accessible by any app except for the service, and the service limits API calls to that. It could be it could be a user, it could be a city. So like let's just say you're on a mobile phone and you're passing back your lat long from a mobile app. You could do a search, this is all hypothetical, but you could do a search based on a location a user's proximity to a business. That's an example. Or you could do it based on proximity to a city center as well. So it could be it'd be like I'm looking for deals near DC and you don't want to give deals all the way in California. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's one. Amazon does this perfectly, right? They have any number of categories. You could, you could uh, do a reverse search on, on related documents. Yeah, so right now that's not implemented, but you could do that hypothetically, yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, so the question is, uh, what is our service layer written in? Um, and the second question is a little bit more complicated. Let me, get, let me answer the first question. So the, first, uh, the service layer right now is um, both a Rack app and a Rails app for the admin side. Uh, we, were sw we were thinking about converting a little bit of that service to Go to handle multi-threaded connections, like make it blazing fast, right? Uh, Golang. Um, uh, the reason why we chose Rails is for rapid prototyping, and the fact that our current tech ops infrastructure supports, uh, supports Rails. So that was the, that was the primary reason for, for making some of the backend technologies Rails. Um, well, can you repeat the second question? I didn't. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the answer to that question, the, the question is, do we have any prioritization of who's consuming the data? Uh, the answer to that is it, it doesn't actually matter for us that much because currently there's only one app actually consuming the data uh, from the search API. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that's the answer to that. <laughs> Good question, though. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess it could just be the same cluster, different end app, not doing all the other things at all. Yeah. Could you elaborate the other side of the intelligence and voice connection doctrine? How large is that data set? Uh it's pretty small. There's actually not that much uh, there's actually not that much content in there. Um, I didn't run the numbers for you, so I would have to check. Uh, uh, right now, um, the other thing that I have to admit is that not all our content is currently indexed in it because we have this distributed indexing. So we've been going through and working through each team and getting all the data up there. So um, I don't think it's not large. It's a pretty small data set. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Whatever the default is. <laughs> Ed, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, so we use Kibana, like you said, to, to kind of see how our users are interacting with our app. And, um, you know, a lot of times you'll see that, like, a focus is in a weird state or something like that, right? And we, when we were trying to track down how they got to that state, it's, it's super helpful to be able to do this deep vision of Kibana, like wildcard searching and searching over different fields uh, in, our, in our server log. So we sent all of our server logs just through, through Kibana and logged that. Yeah, another, another thing that, that'll happen is there'll be a, a piece of code that's in question, and we'll add trace statements that log directly to Kibana with, with things that are easily searchable.
they'll only watch scrap fighting and they will turn it around. They'll only watch Luke and Emma or Corinne and Clay or John Wall to make these things succeed. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> There is one thing that I didn't bring up that I think is kind of a, an interesting technique to use with Elasticsearch. Uh, on any index, you can add metadata. So whenever we deploy the app, uh, I check the mapping of all the different objects and generate a SHA hash of the mapping and store that on the index. And that way, if, that, if the mapping ever changes internally, because I'm storing that in the gem in the Rails on the Rails side of things, uh, I know that I can run a, a migration, or I need to run a migration in the production cluster. So that's something that that I've found immensely helpful. Some people are nodding their heads. Other people. Are <laughs> Anybody else have a custom use case or something they want to maybe bring up? <laughs> There's uh, more snacks, beers, soda, whatever. Yeah. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you.